Every day, all day long, we make choices. Now, most of them we make without a whole lot of thought because they have no obvious moral or life-changing implications to them. Uh, you know, we do a lot of things just simply out of habit, part of our daily routine. We wake up in the morning, we have to decide what to do next. We have to decide what clothes we're going to wear that day, maybe what we'll make for breakfast. Uh, our regular routines help us decide what is going to happen after those feet hit the floor. We develop different patterns for weekdays and Saturdays and Sundays and holidays. And we decide what turns to make on the way to get places we routinely go and what we're going to do when we get there. But there are some choices that are a lot more challenging. We know they're going to impact our lives and often the impacting the lives of others, too. We have to make decisions about our careers, who we're going to marry, where we're going to live. Uh, we have big choices like that. And we don't always know uh, what the future holds. We don't know what the circumstances will be. And there's so many complex matters involved in each of those decisions. It's very hard sometimes to really know what to do as we're trying to decide, for example, when you're in high school or even in college, just what you're going to be doing for your career when you get out or for your work. So we need to turn to someone with advice to help us along. We often turn to people who have a little more information than we do, a little more experience than we have, and have people look at things from a different perspective in case we're missing something. But of course, the best advice comes from God himself. He made everything, so he knows how everything works the best way. Uh, he knows all the contingencies that are going to come along, and he knows all the facts about everything. And so the principles that he gave us in his word set important boundaries for us to stay within as we make our decisions. And so as we're thinking about this, we say, well, what would God's word say about this or that? Or are there principles here that I might be violating if I choose this direction rather than that direction? <clears throat> and so uh, the old what would Jesus do principle is generally good advice, but speculation can be dangerous. We really don't know what Jesus would do in a lot of situations today because we don't have the information. We'd be reading into him things that we believe he would do. What we really need to do is to do what Jesus did. Uh, he did those things that are in the eyes of God right and true. He certainly knew the scriptures. He was one of those who helped reveal it. And so uh, what we need to be directed by are the teachings of Jesus. Uh, they're always good things to consider. Teachings of the whole scripture together. So as Christians, we want to please God in our choices. Uh, people often worry, though, about making choices that are outside the will of God. But commonly, people have a totally wrong understanding of that. They have a wrong idea of what being in God's will means. They believe that somehow that might mess up God's plan. Well, that's never possible. Uh, however, it is possible to do things that violate what God says is good and right. And so to understand this, we need to take a good look at what God says in his word about his will and about our responsibilities in it. So the third petition in the Lord's Prayer tells us that we should pray concerning God's will. Uh, in Matthew 16, or I'm sorry, Matthew 6, verse 10, Jesus tells us we should pray to God that your will will be done uh, on earth as it is in heaven. Now, there's a natural progression here in this model prayer. Uh, it says, your kingdom come, and that leads to your will be done. When we pray for the coming of God's kingdom, we're asking that God's sovereign lordship would become increasingly more clear here on the earth, that the false kingdom of Satan would be diminished and ultimately destroyed, that the kingdom of glory would be built up uh, in its place with lives redeemed by Christ and becoming more and more conformed to his ways. And we pray that the kingdom of glory would be hastened along to completion as we anxiously, excitedly look forward to the return of our Savior and the completion of the work he's given us to do here. So to promote God's kingdom on earth uh, is to see that his will is being done here in your life and as much as you can and influence around you. We want God to be pleased with what we do here on earth, uh, just as he's pleased with what's done in heaven and uh, how there his kingly glory is so clearly seen. <clears throat> like John Calvin said, and I quote, the most important part of God's kingdom lies in his will being done. When Ursinus uh, wrote the Heidelberg Catechism, he said, nor does the kingdom of God come except by the use of those means by which it is advanced. These means now 
are the duties which belong to every man's calling in life. So we need to know what he reveals are our duties, what we ought to be doing. And uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 103, uh, answers this way. Let me put that up for you so you can read along with me. It says, in the third petition, which is, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, we pray that God by his grace would make us able and willing to know, obey, and submit to his will in all things as the angels do in heaven. So in doing God's will here on earth, we're advancing his kingdom. Uh, the one doesn't happen independently of the other. God, the king over all kings, involves the obedience of his people in his great victory. And so why then should we pray for his will to be done if all he wills is always done? Well, Moses gave us a little bit of insight into that in Deuteronomy 29. In verse 24, he sets it up a little bit by uh, pointing to how the nations were looking at Israel when she broke God's covenant and God judged his own people. It says there, all nations would say, why has the Lord done so to this land? Uh, what does the heat of this great anger mean? In other words, Israel, aren't you God's people? Why is he pouring out his judgment on you? Well, God's answer to why he would do a thing so hard to understand is summarized in verse 29 of Deuteronomy 29. There it says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. There's only one will of God. Some things in his plan are not made known, while others are. And so parts of God's plan are kept secret from us. From all eternity, everything is done according to God's plan. As a creator, he made all things to be exactly the way he knew was best. Uh, he's the all-able God, uh, and his plan is infallibly carried out, and it can't be changed no matter who wants to change it. There's nothing that could surprise God because he knows all things from the beginning. And there's nothing that could come along that would make him regret his perfect choices. You know, if God regretted what he decreed, then he's neither perfect nor unchangeable. Uh, we will be talking about uh, some other kind of being than the God revealed in Scripture. Uh, that kind of being couldn't properly be called God. These verses where it sometimes is translated that God repented of something that he had done are not accurately translated. Uh, it doesn't fit the context to use some of the words that back in 1611 were maybe more understandable when King James was translated. But uh, I wrote a helpful article about that, which is called, Does God Repent of Things He Has Done? And although I can't get into all that here, uh, you could look that up on our website. I'm sure that um, you'd find some answers to that. <clears throat> but there's two helpful verses in the Psalms that make it very clear that God is totally sovereign and always gets his way. Psalm 115, verse 3. It says, But God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. You couldn't be much more plain than that. Psalm 135, verse 6. It says, Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. In heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all deep places. There are many verses like that all through Scripture. David's blessing to the Lord in 1 Chronicles 29 uh, shows his confidence in God's sovereignty. Uh, and notice as I read this section from verses 10 to 13, the similarities between this and the Lord's Prayer. It says, Therefore David blessed the Lord before all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. And you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, O God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. So just in the Lord's Prayer, this uh, prayer speaks about God as our Father. Uh, and it praises his glorious name. It says that uh, he is uh, the kingdom and the power and the glory and his kingdom is forever and ever. And it mentions his kingship and that he's head over all and rules over all. 
You see, God decreed all things according to the counsel of his own will. No one can violate the decrees or keep them from coming to pass exactly the way God said they would. In Isaiah 14, 24, God said, Surely as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. And as I have purposed, so it shall stand. And then in verse 27, the prophet adds these words, For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out, and who will turn it back? You see, God's secret plan, his decreed will, is always carried out. Even Satan had to ask permission from God to do his evil things. This is clearly shown in what happened in the case of Job. In Job uh, uh, 42, we see that he cries out in, in uh, repentance for daring to question God's perfect plan of acting like, Lord, Lord why are you doing this to me? And uh, he says, I know you can do everything, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Job never really found out all the details about why he suffered, but he learned an important question. God does things that we don't need to understand and know, and we need to be settled and satisfied with that. In fact, the New American Standard translates that last part of uh, verse 2 in, in Job 42, saying, No purpose of thine can be thwarted. You know, Though we don't yet see how it all fits together, it all does. God even allows sin, and yet he's not the direct cause of it. Uh, in fact, he turns evil around so that it would accomplish his eternal purpose. Uh, God's secret will, his eternal plan, is always done. And when evil hearts sin, they condemn themselves and they show the tragedy of opposing God, something God wants to be revealed. By overcoming sin and evil, God reveals his grace and mercy and his victorious plan of salvation. So the secret will of God only becomes known when God carries it out, as we see his plan unfolding in history day by day. We can't know uh, what nations are going to rise or fall until they do. Uh, we can't know uh, when we'll become sick or when we'll die until we do. Uh, we won't know what opportunities are going to come along and how it's going to work out if we accept those opportunities. Uh, we don't know what accidents or benefits or disasters are going to happen until they do. God, uh, in his providence, turns the hearts of kings and of children, stirs up the storms, calms the seas, even shapes the hard-to-understand wishes of our own hearts in order to bring about a revealing of his glory. And so the problem is that some think of God as if he's not what he really says he is. They imagine him unable to do everything he planned and that we can mess it up real easily. We have to be careful we don't mess up what God wants to be done. If we just make a wrong choice somewhere along the line, become very fretful about it, but nothing could be more opposite to what the Bible directly and clearly teaches. But parts of God's plan are not kept secret. They are revealed to us. They are the things that are pleasing to him morally, the things that are conforming to his, uh, his own character and nature. And so in Deuteronomy 29, 29, it says, Those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So the Bible tells us what things are pleasing to God, and uh, those are the things we need to aim to do. It tells us what's morally good and what's wise, and it explains how we ought to behave here in God's world, uh, out there at work and in the church and in our families. Uh, and without Scripture, there's no way we could know for sure what God has said. In Romans 7, 7, Paul said, I would not have known sin except through the law. The Bible is what shows us what we can do to honor and please our Heavenly Father and what things are designed to work a certain way here in His world. And so we run our businesses and families in the way that God designed. And if we did that, we'd find that they'd all work a whole lot better than they often do. <clears throat> so uh, we need to uh, understand a little bit about what the Bible actually teaches in order that we might know what God uh, is pleased with us doing here as far as what actually honors him. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, Paul reminded Timothy that this is how we know God's will for our lives. It says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God 
and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the Bible tells us uh, that what God expects us to know about him and what he expects us to understand about ourselves and our own responsibilities. And we live in a time that really hates rules and responsibilities, especially those that apply to everybody all the time. Uh, many churches have totally abandoned moral principles, even the Ten Commandments, uh, as if they don't apply anymore. Uh, the Sabbath day isn't set aside as special from the other days. Uh, worship has been transformed in entertainment in a lot of churches. Uh, we need to promote the revealed will of God in a world that laughs at the idea. Or a world that thinks that we're extremists if we really believe that God's word, word is true and still applies to us today. So people can be out of the will of God. Uh, it depends, though, entirely on what you mean by that. The Bible doesn't put it that way. No one can actually wander outside of what God has eternally decreed. Our choices are free. And uh, there are our own real choices. Nobody's ever compelled by God to choose something he didn't really want to choose. It's not like we're saying, no, no, Lord, I don't want to do that. And yet we, our hands go out and do it or something. Uh, we decide to do it because we, in our own moral depravity, sometimes do things that are outside of what God has said we should do. And so we need to be careful that we uh, prayerfully strive to conform to what God has revealed to us as to what is honoring to him. And that's what we're really praying about here in this situation. But our choices, whatever they may be, the good ones and the evil ones, will always turn out in the end to fulfill exactly what God had decreed. Sometimes to our shame. Sometimes uh, to our wonderful thankfulness that we are used by God to advance his kingdom in good ways. But we can't mess up God's secret plans. Uh, we can discover ourselves to be part of the rebellion, uh, but we certainly uh, need to be aware of what these moral responsibilities are. There's no excuse. We can't blame God and say, well, God made me do it. Well, that kind of a careless and uncaring attitude shows a heart that's unredeemed, one that's not touched by the work of the Holy Spirit and the sacrifice of our Savior. And that should alarm us. There's a good example, though, of the way it ought to be in the story of those three captured Hebrew teenagers in Daniel 3. During the captivity of God's people, King Nebuchadnezzar demanded the worship of an idol. Now, these three teen boys, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, would not disobey what God had said. And they wouldn't worship the idol. <clears throat> So when the angry king threatened to throw them into the fiery furnace, here's what they said. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, then let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Now, we know these three boys by their Babylonian names. Uh, they've been a bit Americanized. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They didn't know what God had planned for them. Uh, they might have been thrown into a fire, but they knew what God had commanded. And they knew that nothing would happen if God hadn't purposed it to happen. They were willing to wait and see what happens. Uh, he was able to deliver them if he was determined to do so. But if not, if that wasn't God's plan, they were going to obey anyway, because that's what would please God. So then, how do we make all these daily decisions? How do we choose our jobs, our career, our spouse, our houses? And how should our planned vacations and recreation times be handled? Well, we can't know the secret plan of God until it happens. We don't know how our vacations will turn out, how our marriages or jobs will turn out. We don't know how well our house is going to hold up over the next how many years we decide to live in it. But we can know what God has made known in his word. The facts and principles there are powerful and they're sufficient if we trust in them that we might make wise choices. Now, we might make mistakes about you know what house we're going to buy. Uh, God's word won't tell you how to check the plumbing, but it can tell you that you should have a check to be a responsible steward of God's, uh, what he's entrusted to you, the money he's given you or the finances. And so in each of these cases, there are principles that should guide us in making better decisions, not perfect ones, but better ones. First, we need to know and understand God's word, though. Uh, we aren't going to make our decisions by miraculous visions or 
uh, some supposed private revelations that that age of God speaking to us that way passed away when the Bible was completed. Uh, we shouldn't expect signs and dreams and omens and angels to come down and tell us what job we should take or you know, who we should marry and uh, you know, what house to rent or buy. But instead we have these principles revealed in Scripture that become our guide. God's moral rules set up the boundaries within which we can decide. And so we should never consider anything that violates God's moral principles or ignores his instructions. And it's wise to seek out godly counsel from those who might see things that we're missing. But if we know and respect those limits and we honor God's word and wisdom prayerfully, then we can be confident that the choices that we make are made knowing that the Lord is guiding us. Secondly, we need to observe the circumstances and opportunity as God's secret plan is unfolding around us. In other words, look at providence. See what God's doing. What's happening in the stock market? Is this job I'm preparing for still going to be there when I graduate? Uh, we, we need to see how God's working around us in his world and unfolding his plan of history. And so uh, we see that sometimes what's an opportunity today may turn out to be a disaster tomorrow. And so we should be sensitive to the talents and skills that God gives us. And uh, we should listen to the interest that he stirs up in our heart that makes us gravitate towards certain uh, people and things. And, uh, you know, we need to use the minds that God gave us and the lessons that we've learned in school and from other people to decide what choices best fit with God's word and the priorities that he reveals there. So, third, we need to be expecting the guidance of the Holy Spirit. This doesn't mean that uh, he whispers secrets or new revelations to us. It means that we pray that God will guide us. We ask his spirit to direct us by God's word, and we make our choices, uh, ones that most please him and promote his kingdom and glory. But we do it with confidence because that's the way God tells us to do it. And so well, whatever God brings our way, we need to accept it and then say, Lord, how shall I live within it? So this is what God expects us to do. We need to faithfully and prayerfully apply his word in making all our choices. Uh, we're to make confident decisions within the boundaries of what the Bible teaches. We need to have sensitivity to the circumstances of his providence. And we need to, by diligent and sincere prayer, submit to the Spirit's guidance in our lives. Now, we might make choices that don't turn out well compared to what we wanted. However, if we made our decisions in a truly godly way, we should accept the consequences whenever they come along. So rather than wishing we'd turn left instead of right when we're in a car accident, we should ask at that moment, uh, you know, what would the Lord have us to do to honor him in that situation? You can't go back and change the past or wish it away. And if we do something sinful, then we have the duty to sincerely and humbly repent of it. We need to rest confidently in Christ's forgiveness as he paid for the debt of our sins on the cross. And we need to pray that he would deliver us from ever doing that wrong thing again. If we slip and slide again, we come back to him with repentance, sincerely, confidence in Christ's power to work in our heart, to forgive and to help us progress out of it. So, uh, what do we pray for here in this prayer then? We pray, thy will be done. But we're saying that we're pleased to see God's plan unfold the way he knows is best. And we accept his divine decrees as they unfold moment by moment. We, we truly want his will to be done because we love and trust him. And we're uh, saying that we're satisfied with our callings in life, our talents and our resources and opportunities that he gives us, and we want to use them in ways that honor him too. We're saying that we want to be able to see God at work in all that happens, so we want him to open our eyes to behold how uh, we may play a part uh, in his kingdom. And we pray that we might do it in a godly and honoring way rather than being among those that display how his wrath is rightly called out upon some. And we pray that what occurs on earth should to the best of our ability and with God's enablement conform to what truly pleases God just as things are pleasing to him in heaven.